How many people, well, I think you guys see this critical thing, how many people here consider themselves skeptics? Quite a few, all right. Go ahead, not everyone, and, and if you, whether you are or aren't, and, uh, but this is, if you haven't read The Demon Hunter World, it's quite a bit, it's, I don't know if they've updated it, but it's, uh, it's, it's a great, I mean, I read it, year, I don't know how many years, it came out 20 years ago. It's a great book, and it's something that I give to everybody who I want to start thinking a little bit more skeptically. It's like a great starter book. If you have somebody out there who just, you know, has a crazy magical thinking and you want to get, it's a good book to, to get started. So, uh, as you can tell. So, um, please, if you haven't read Carl Sagan's Demon Hunter World. Um, your speaker for today is um, the, like I said earlier, the president of the James Randi Educational Foundation. And again, if you are a skeptic, you already know who he is. I, I guarantee you. So please help me welcome to the stage, DJ Grover. Skeptics, humanists, Olafidians, rationalists, atheists, agnostics, skeptics are especially uh, happy to hear that Ian would be emceeing. Uh, you have great talent in this guy, uh, joining you repeatedly, so let's hear it for his question. <laughs> of the James Randi Educational Foundation. Now, I've been told I have a time limit, so I can't do my normal song and dance commercial for the organization, but that won't keep me from speaking through just a couple of things about our little nonprofit, our educational efforts, both for young people, the media, uh, teachers, uh, the general public, parents, etc. I'm in my sixth year as president of the J. Drain Educational Foundation, which was founded almost 20 years ago by the magician, the skeptic, uh, James Randi. We do a lot of things. Uh, I, I want to just speed through that because you'd be surprised, or at least I should confess that I've been surprised, as I travel around the country and meet all sorts of interesting folks, how few people know all the amazing things that we do. One is the amazing meeting, which I, uh, you, you applauded just like we rehearsed, thank you. Uh, the amazing meeting is the largest gathering of its kind in the world. It's a big conference we put on in Vegas every year. Uh, and we're really lucky to have some special, talented friends who are always on the program. That's Penn & Teller. Bill Nye is joining us again this year. Sarah Mayhew is an uh, illustrator of a manga skeptic. She does sort of a Japanese-style comic book teaching skepticism and critical thinking. Of course, our favorite, Bill deGrasse Tyson, is doing this a number of times. That's Adam Savage from TV's Mythbusters, close friend of Brandy's the Foundation. And you see that just like believers, skeptics love to touch the hem of the garments of <laughs> the people on the program, not this picture. When I came aboard five years ago, I was really interested in having the James Randi Educational Foundation increase its focus on resources for youngsters. So it's not just those of us who can get together and argue about another reason why God or ghosts don't exist, but instead we started creating resources for the classroom. These are kits for teachers or homeschoolers' parents that use the investigation of the paranormal to teach critical thinking attached to national science content standards, AAAS science education standards. Notice uh, one is called Do You Have ESV? It is not entitled There Ain't No Such Thing as ESV. Do you have ESV? It's a kit that comes with those little cards that are called Xander cards where students uh, investigate whether or not any in their number actually has a paranormal ability and they learn something about the investigator bias, statistics, etc. We have one on cognitive fairies, which may seem trivial. Cognitive fairies, for those of you who are interested in the history of uh, skepticism was a hoax perpetrated on Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of Sherlock Holmes. A couple uh, English schoolgirls have photographs of fairies they found in their backyard. And who's been losing by it? Now, we use this, this exploration of the topic to talk about the role of celebrities in inculcating paranormal belief. And we actually connect the dots to folks like. Uh, Jenny McCarthy and vaccine denialism and why you should believe what you believe and is it a good reason to believe it just because a celebrity says so? 
We have kits on dowsing, on astrology. We have eight of these kits so far for free. Any of you, if you're educators or parents, then you can get them at win.org or at our various events. We, have, we make available courses online and uh, uh, workshops, and of course, the Randy Foundation does the Million Dollar Paranormal Challenge which is a standing offer to give $1 million to anyone who could prove uh, it, under mutually agreed upon scientific or test conditions that they possess a paranormal ability. In 20 years, we've had a lot of applicants and zero people who have passed the test. Now, sometimes we're accused, as, uh, uh, we're accused of stacking the deck. Uh, the magicians among us may do uh, uh, some deck stacking in, in their line of work, but uh, we work with the claimants to be very open and transparent and come to a mutually agreed upon protocol so no one can say, well, I never said I couldn't do that, right? So we agree to the protocol beforehand, and every year at our Vegas conference, we do a live test. Um, no one's passed. We do amazing meetings at sea. This is one we did for the Mayan end of the world in 2012, uh, exploring apocalyptic prophecies, doomsday cults, all while on a cruise ship in the Maya Riviera. And uh, it all sounds like fun. Uh, yes, we are lighthearted about some of the things we do, but even when it's lighthearted, it's with a point, with a very serious point. One example of this is when we focus on the celebrity psychic James Von Prague. James Von Prague is a TV psychic who says that he could talk to dead people and for his own crisis, he will, uh, I think, pretend to connect you with your deceased relatives. We challenged him with a million dollars. Prove that your stuff is real, and we'll give you a million. He ignored us. He ignored national media when they asked him about our challenge. So we thought, if he won't talk to us, but he says he'll talk to dead people, we would bring some dead people to him. <laughs> So one of the events we did uh, in Southern California, we had a weekend uh, a spiritualist circle to talk to dead people. We brought some zombies, I guess some undead people, to his event. Uh, a viral video we created of this has been, uh, uh, garnered some national media attention, form, Forbes, LA Weekly, and I brought a clip of that video uh, that I'm about to play uh, just because I think it illustrates one of the big points of our conversation today, and we'll talk about it after. Okay, so as most of you know, we're here tonight to shine the spotlight on James Von Prague, this celebrity psychic medium who says he can talk to dead people, and that dead people talk back to him. We say he's taking advantage of the stuck in their grief. So, we at the James Randy Educational Foundation issued James Von Prague a million dollar challenge if he could just prove that his stuff is real. He won't take our calls. He won't talk to us. He won't talk to the media. who have asked him about this. So if he won't talk to us and he won't talk to the media, we wonder if he won't talk to some dead people.
conclusions uh, based on that project. Of course, some skeptics focus just on alternative medicine, complementary and alternative medicine claims. There's a division of labor, in other words. But I'm arguing that skepticism is foundational. And even that if atheism is just skepticism of one belief, atheism without belief in God, uh, that it doesn't necessarily go far enough, and it doesn't imply a form of skepticism. Indeed, I know well-meaning atheists, great buddies of mine, that I would not consider skeptics. I know atheists who are uh, moon landing hoax denialists, or atheists who uh, uh, believe in conspiracy theories about big pharma, right? So for me, atheism is not enough. Now, I'm an atheist. I believe in consistently and widely applied skepticism, and I'm an equal opportunity skeptic that I think you should be skeptical of ghosts because there's no evidence to support that claim, and of God because there's no evidence to support that claim. But just being an atheist to me is not enough. Likewise, humanism, which is so important, and when people ask me what I don't believe, I say, well, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. But if they ask me what I do believe, I'll say I'm a secular humanist, because that describes a, a whole set of ethical commitments uh, that uh, motivate me and inspire me. But I know humanists who believe in chakras and, and uh, past lives and you know, I've spent a lot of good time to Unitarian Universalist churches where you're not going to find a fundamentalist, but you'll find someone that believes in what skeptics call woo-woo. You know, people who believe in uh, past life regression or, or any of these uh, sorts of claims that I will argue in my presentation are actually harmful. And there's an ethical imperative to uh, uh, promote a little uh, critical inquiry into those claims. So, sacrilege uh, at a gathering like this, but to me, humanism is not enough. It's important, and you know, I'm not so sure I want to hang out with just atheists who aren't humanists. I mean, just think of, uh, you know, for the leading uh, uh, non-humanist atheists in the 20th century, conservatives like Ayn Rand or Leo Strauss or Milton Friedman, folks who uh, have great arguments but whose ethical commitments might not overlap mine. Just because you're an atheist doesn't mean you're a humanist. Just because you're a humanist doesn't mean you're a skeptic. And we conflate those things at our peril. I want to uh, talk just really quickly for this uh, group about skepticism. It's more than what you think it is. Uh, it's a method of inquiry. It's not a set of non-beliefs. And it's certainly not just being cynical. I have friends sometimes say, oh, well, you're a skeptic of everything. You just disbelieve. Well, I'm stating a claim that that's not skepticism. That imagination of skepticism is actually a sort of cynicism. It's a uh, denial of knowledge. And you get this in the academy a lot. We'll get into that. But from my advantage, skepticism is just a way to inquire. It's a way of finding things out. I think an important component of skepticism, and I'm inspired by this every time I think about it, is Andrean's line that there's a really there's a built-in humility in this skepticism. It's not an arrogant uh, claim of what is true and what isn't, but it's a humble approach to claims at, that says, you're very new at this, you may be mistaken, you've been wrong before. That's skepticism to me. And uh, if you watch the recent Cosmos series with Neil deGrasse Tyson, Andrean wrote that. He's sort of a presenter on stage. He's a good buddy, but her words inspired me in this way. She also had a hand in writing the first Cosmos. And this is the posture of skepticism that I think is valuable. And, and I think there's an ethical imperative to promote. What is it, skepticism? Well, it's not just focused on things that go bump in the night. It's not this epistemological nihilism that you get in the academy, this postmodernism that says there ain't no such thing as truth, that science is just one mythic narrative among, among many others, that any claim is just as good as any other claim. That sounds like it's a caricature of a position, but it's not. Talk to any uh, folks in philosophy, and you'll hear uh, that this is one strain of uh, thought in the academy. So I want to conclude uh, by talking about two test cases 
uh, that I think encapsulate the moral imperative to advance skepticism, not just in our community, but outside of it. One is uh, the dowsing rod bomb detectors. How many of you have heard of the ADE-651? Four people. I think this is one of the all-time greatest hits in organized skepticism, uh, but many of us don't know about it. ADE-651 is that. It's a gizmo, a handheld gizmo, that purports to find any hidden object. Uh, it can be programmed to find any hidden object, but it's actually used uh, at bomb checkpoints. It was used at bomb checkpoints in Iraq, sold to the tune of millions of dollars to the UK government, the US government, and the Iraqi government, and it's fake. It's a dowsing rod that has no moving parts. That's a freestanding antenna on a lubricated rod, and it moves based on how you tilt uh, autonomically. Uh, uh, you don't even realize that you're moving it. It's called the idiomotor effect. It's a physiological effect. That if you're holding it, and you're holding completely still, still, and you're thinking about something over there, you will unwittingly slightly tilt it, and the needle will move. Now, the reason this is so alarming brings chills to me, is that this man, James McCormick, a, a UK cop, sold millions of dollars worth of these gizmos to the three governments that I mentioned for use at bomb checkpoints. Soldiers were trained to hold the AD-651s and shuffle their feet because there's something about the energy of the earth and connecting and so whatever, and use a, a round vehicles at bomb checkpoints. Uh, I don't have the specific numbers, some of this is classified, but there uh, are confirmed deaths when vehicles were passed through the bomb checkpoints using these gizmos. Now, it took a magician, it took James Randi, not these governments, but James Randi, to investigate these audacious claims, and he took the dang thing apart and realized there are no working parts, and he exposed it as just another in a long series of dowsing rods. He's in prison now, uh, James McCormick, I'm happy to say. And uh, these uh, AD-651s are no longer sold, even though it had previously cost taxpayers millions and billions of dollars. But the bad news is, similar devices are now being sold to the governments of Sri Lanka for disaster uh, relief scenarios. Imagine if there's an earthquake or something, you have to find missing bodies. Or the government of Mexico at drug checkpoints. Imagine the similarities, implications of a search of your vehicle because someone's holding a fake dowsing rod. Uh, so these things matter. These aren't trivial issues where it's just a matter of letting people believe what they want to believe. There's a moral imperative to expose harmful nonsense. I want to uh, talk about one other test case scenario, and that's psychics. I mentioned uh, God off of the Unitarians, and I have a number of Unitarian buddies who sort of believe in psychics and stuff like that. And I was at, a, at an atheist, a Midwest atheist conference in Wisconsin. And I gave my talk, and the James Trinity Educational Foundation had a table in the back where we distributed literature, and a young atheist came up to me, college student, and said, look, I really like your talk, but you really seem to have it out for psychics. I mean, what's the deal with that? Haven't universities proven that psychics are real? I mean, not the TV psychics, not those fakes that talk to dead people, but I mean, you know, psychics, like it, uh, universities. So just, again, because you're an atheist, I don't think it follows that you're a really critical thinker. Uh, I want to just point out, I'm not making uh, an overreaching claim that all psychics are frauds. I think none are real, so they're all fake, but they're not all frauds by which I mean some psychics believe their own nonsense. There's a sort of self-deception. Uh, there are storefront psychics. You see any neon sign advertising a psychic, uh, I'll bet you're on the drinks that that psychic is a known fraud. 
using fake and deceptive methods to bamboozle people out of their money. We don't have time to get into the methods, but it's uh, an area of my expertise. It's something I've dealt with for the past 15 years, my background in magic, so if you want to talk afterwards, uh, I'd be happy to get into that. But there is another category of psychics, call them the new age psychics. Uh, people at some psychic fairs or someone who picked up a uh, tarot deck or something. These people believe that they're real and why? Because they get a lot of powerful validation back from people they give readings to. Uh, and it's enough to make you think you really have an illusion. I'm a former professional magician. I used to do cold reading and you know magic shows. Um, and I saw the seduction, the seductive power of people saying, wow, I mean, you didn't do a magic trick there, and I didn't, I did psychological manipulations, but I saw how seductive the claims were. I'll just give one quick example. Um, when, as a teenager, I was a professional magician, and I did all sorts of different magic shows, because you had to sort of have to broaden your horizons and have shows for different niches if you're going to stay busy as a magician. I had a magic show called The Magic of God's Love, right? Because, and I was a Christian at the time, so it, it sort of made sense. Because God's love, unlike magic, there's no mere illusion, right? I had a drug awareness magic show, a library magic show, and I had a psychic magic show. And uh, for one of my psychic shows, I, uh, first half of it, I did normal magic tricks but dressed up like psychic powers, you know, looking very melodramatically. I, I had a white turtleneck, wearing an amulet, I, you know, came in, my name was Daniel Joseph, not DJ Murphy. Um, talked about how I've always had these abilities and they buzzed with me, and I decided the best thing to do with them is to share them with people. So I did magic tricks like looking at a watch and making it stop, or making a match stand on its head, telekinesis, etc. And then I excused myself, and I went to the restroom, uh, the, the bathroom, and I just hung out there for like 15 minutes, doing nothing but sort of building suspense, making people wonder, what's he doing in there? And I told them that I was meditating for the second half of the presentation. When I came out, I did no magic tricks. I did what's called cold reading, a set of psychological manipulations to make it appear that I'm saying very specific things about people around the table. This was a little retirement party, just six people. I'm at one head of the table, or uh, the one end of the table, and the retiring couple, uh, the man who's retiring is at the other end of the table, and two couples, their friends, are each side. And I started just doing really normal scripted off the shelf, good shelf full readings. So I looked at the woman who hired me and I said, um, a lot of images are coming to my mind. I don't know what they mean. I'm just going to say that you'll have to help me understand what they mean. But uh, I see at work there's a conflict. There's some issue. An older man with dark hair, there's going to be a, a change coming up. Now I'm uh, uh, truncating the whole read, but it's basically hit and goes. And she was stunned, and I, you know, what I can do is seem excited, right? You just have to be all-knowing Daniel Joseph. No, and uh, uh, she said, well, yeah, I don't get along with whatever his name, boss at work. Older, he's older, with dark hair, he's taller. And so I'm moving departments, and everyone was really amazed. Except for the guy sitting to my right. He had tattoos, he was also retiring at age, he moved back in his chair, folded his arms and said, all right, tell me what happened to me today. Now that's sort of a challenge condition for a cold reader, you know, I did not have a lot to do with that. But uh, one important uh, goal in cold reading is just to go with your hunches. So I looked at his tattoos and it was just a hunch, not a supernatural and educated guess. He, looked like he was from the military, I thought, well, maybe someone contacted him out of the blue. And maybe someone he served with. And I said, well, you're going to think these are just generalities, but these are the images that came to my mind. Today or recently, you were contacted by someone you haven't seen in a very long time or haven't yet met. Okay? <laughs> and then I said, either male or female. <laughs> around the table, and he didn't sniff them. He was still sort of stubbornly incredulous, but his wife nudged him and said, well, honey, tell him. And he said, my daughter called us, and she's pregnant, and they don't know if it's a boy or a girl. And the table was wild. <laughs> and of 
course, I still just had to nod slowly in my own way. Yeah. Yeah. Until the end of the show, when I, get, I gave everyone my magic business cards, and I told them it was all fake, and it's forever taking over, et etc. et cetera. But I saw how seductive it was, because I got validation back from the people around the table. So imagine if you're starting out in the movie Psychic Powers, and you start doing these readings with the tarot deck or something, and you just say a bunch of general stuff to people coming to you, some of it will hit, and people will say, my gosh, that was really helpful. And, and it could really build your own credulity in your nonsense point. So, I want to, um, how are we doing on time? Can someone? We're about. Okay. So, there's a great video that I can show you maybe afterwards of, uh, of James von Prague, I almost pity him, failing miserably at some cold reading uh, on TV. It's the most spectacular failure of any psychic I've ever seen, so hit me up after the talk. My big issue, and the ethical point here, why psychics matter to me, or fake bomb detectors, because the stuff hurts people. Psychics are, that, that was a, a picture of Rose Marks, a matriarch of a family of psychics who stole upward of $45 million from her clients. She's now in prison, another win, uh, because her clients, it's very hard to get people who have been scammed by psychics to come forward and testify, but her clients did, including Jude Devereaux, the romance author, where Rose Marks, and, and all of her children were also psychics, all of her female, all of her women children, uh, where they made not just claims to tell you your future, but essentially fake therapy. You're having problems with your relationships or romance or you need some financial planning advice. Well, who are you going to go to? A psychic or an expert? And that's my issue with psychics or mediums like James Von Brock. They're not qualified to be grief counselors. If you've lost a loved one and you go to someone who's giving you false hope talking to dead people, uh, you're going to be stunted in your grief, but if you go to a qualified therapist, uh, you can get the help that you need. So, my point here is that as ethical folks who don't have recourse to the supernatural to derive our ethics, this stuff should be more on our radar. And essentially, uh, my argument is that skepticism, uh, so here are some resources we provide to people when the celebrity psychic comes to your neck of the woods, uh, the celebrity psychic comes to San Diego, members of the Sunday Assembly can share these helpful informational resources with folks uh, going to the event. So it's not just they saying, it's not just the crotchety about another person's uh, unwarranted belief, but it's applying skepticism in the public's interest, in the interest, the, the, the ethical interest of people who unduly believe, who have undue credibility. Skepticism is not just saying no to other people's beliefs, it's about doing good, important to the Sunday Assembly, by happening to be right about these supernatural claims. Thank you very much.